Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, this is our third lecture on the European Middle Ages. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a wide-ranging uh, lecture today. Uh, we're talking about the big major concepts, manners, feudalism, knights, chivalry, throw some troubadours in there uh, before we go. All right, so let's get started. What we want to see, we're going to talk about a little bit with uh, economics uh, in the time period. So the early Middle Ages are going to witness a switch from the system the Romans had set up as they expanded into Western Europe with the Roman Latifundia. And we're going to see a switch as the Roman uh, times uh, kind of collapse and Rome's authority falls away to what's called the medieval manor. And the big, sh the big shift and change that's being caused by this is the decline in slavery. If you remember from our last lecture, we talked about the invasions of the Vikings and the Magyars and the Muslims. So, I mean, if you have all these people uh, constantly under attack, everybody really has to work together. And so we see a movement pretty quickly where we see, particularly in Western Europe, a movement away from slavery into the rise of what's called serfdom. And serf is an economic term. Uh, a serf is someone who is legally unfree. So that the way most people put it is that they're tied to the land. Um, you're, you're where you're born on uh, that particular manner. You cannot leave uh, to go to a different manner to, to be able to negotiate different ways. You are, quote unquote, stuck there. Uh, but unlike slaves, you do have certain rights. And so that's kind of the, the difference between a serf and a slave. Uh, if Mr. Cranmer, Lord King Mr. Cranmer dies, all right, and my manor transfers into my heirs, they own not just the land that the manor is built on and all the buildings, but they own the people too. Um, so, so that's where, again, it's that's the slave aspect of it. But serfs also are, gain a little bit more f freedom in the sense that they can choose to marry whoever they want. Um, they're required to get their own land to work themselves. Um, so they have their own separate piece of land that they work, that they get their food from, and they are uh, legally entitled to time of their own. So you're giving, say, four days a week of working uh, for your lord on your manor, and then you get three days a week, for example, to work on your own land, to work with your own livestock. So uh, it's very hard to stop being a serf. Um, we, we don't see a bit, whole lot of uh, rising and falling in the social structure. We'll get to that in a little bit. But again, this is a legal term um, that's kind of describing what's going on for this time period. Now, Charlemagne's expansions is what in the Carolingian kings are going to spread this system throughout much of Europe. So as Charlemagne expands into areas that were maybe not so much quote unquote Roman or as Romanized, they're going to spread this use of manners and serfs throughout much of Europe. And then as people, more and more people adopt it, it starts to move even farther abroad, say to the English Isles or into Scandinavia and then farther east into say Russia. Manners themselves are very self-sufficient. We talked about in our very first lecture of the unit how the Dark Ages has collapsed the Roman characteristic of urbanization. So there's very little trade going on between these uh, manners. So that means you've got to make everything yourself. Uh, so what we see here is that the manners become the basic economic arrangement of the time as people are working to figure out how I need stuff. You can't just go to a Walmart and buy a t-shirt. If your shovel breaks, you can't just go to Paris and buy a new shovel. You have to make it on your own. And these manners are going to kind of develop into their own little self-contained worlds that have to do everything for themselves. So obviously all the manners are going to look a little bit different from each other. Um, but your basic one, if you want to take a look over to the left, uh, you, you've got your manor house. You're going to have a church on there. Uh, you're going to have a town. Uh, and then most of your manor is going to be farmland. All right, so you're a pasture land for your animals. You'll need woodlands for your buildings. Um, and then you, you've got your other stuff. So as you're thinking about uh, the homework that you have to make your own manor, hints, winks, nudges, you might want to pay attention to this. So you have your manor house. Eventually, this will expand to be bigger, more opulent. We'll get into castles here in a second. Um, but again, it could just be a larger house that the Lord would own. Uh, you've got a village, you'll have a church. And remember, it's self-sufficient. So anything you need on there, you're going to need. All right, You're going to need a blacksmith. You're going to need a um, lumber mill. You're going to need 
a church. You're going to need farms. You're going to need uh, stables. You're going to need all that stuff um, in, in order to be able to make anything that you want at your manor, on your manor, uh, what have you. So this is a little bit of a model, again, showing the, the same type of thing. So when we're thinking about creating our own manners, uh, you want to make sure that you, you have to think in this way that everything you need has to be made on that manor. So if you're designing Mr. Cranmer's manor, you're going to have the manor house where Mr. Cranmer lives. You're going to have where the serfs live, where the church is going to be set up. Um, all those different things need to be thought about to understand that this is a self-contained little world that really does not um, – have, particularly in the early Middle Ages, a lot of interactions with other manners or um, other kind of uh, larger political units, to be honest. So as we move through the economic system of manners, we're going to move to more of a political social system of medieval feudalism. Uh, before we get into the longest definition that you're going to write down all year in your study guides, we'll give you some time to start working on that. Uh, understand that if you were to take a Middle Ages class at the college level, uh, this is the word feudalism very much might be thought as another F word um, and how bad uh, it, that, that kind of is said. Um, it's very contentious um, amongst scholars and particularly medieval historians about how this uh, system actually worked. But again, we're a freshman high school class, so we're trying to simplify things just a little bit. So medieval feudalism is a political system in which nobles are granted the use of their lands that legally belong to their king in exchange for their loyalty, military service, and protection of the people who live on the land. Uh, this is a system very much based on rights and obligations, and we're going to have a couple different graphics show up to help explain what all these long words mean in one way, shape, or another, right? Uh, as we're moving through here, we got a couple terms in the study guide, so these are kind of interchangeable. So uh, a lord or a, a king has a whole bunch of land. They cannot manage all that land themselves from the technological uh, points of that time, so they delegate parts of that land to different people, right? Those delegated lands uh, who are given on for specific reasons or personal reasons are called fiefs. So a vassal will own a fief, which is a grant of land given to that vassal by a lord. Any land that was granted from a lord to a vassal is called a fief. A vassal is someone who receives a fief from a lord. So the, the, the terms are kind of interchangeable. Um, and they can work through the, the, the sentence. But that's what we're kind of doing as you are trying to figure out what to put in the study guide. Again, a lord is someone who grants land called a fief to a vassal. A fief is a grant of land from a lord to a vassal, and a vassal is someone who receives a fief, a grant of land, from a lord. So those kind of how all those system works, and again, if we were to hint, wink, nudge, write an essay question about this, that's kind of what we were looking for to help explain this system here. Uh, group that is in here, um, and again, particularly at the vassal level, might be knights. And knights are mounted horsemen who pledge to fight for their lords in exchange for fiefs. So the economic arrangement that's going on is the knights receive a fief, a grant of land, of which the hard work of harvesting crops and making money off that manor is done by the serfs on that land, which goes to the knight to be able to pay for their military training and pretty much their free time to train and in exchange for that land to be able to get that free money and time the knight is required to provide military service to that lord so in feudalism these social classes are very well defined we don't see very much movement up between there you can't be a really good peasant all right and then work your way up that's a very rare thing and that's why when we talk about and we hear like fairy tales from this time period what's a common fairy tale is that a a lowly peasant finds out that he's the um, kind of wayward son of a lord. I mean, kind of, you kind of get these wishes granted to you to move up because that's very much a wish of the lower class people because it's not something that happened. So again, uh, we want to emphasize that this is simplifying the system very much. Uh, this is set up like quotation marks, a pyramid. So we have three groups in feudalism. You'll have those who fought for everyone. So the nobles and knights who are fighting um, to gain more territory, gain more wealth, uh, protect everyone. There are those who prayed for the society, the people of the church, the monks, the nuns, the priests, and then those who worked. 
uh, the peasants, the serfs who provided the basic economic uh, logistical foundation that the whole system is then built upon. So I know a lot of words here, a lot of stuff to turn on here. So we're going to give you a couple of graphics to kind of simplify this uh, a little bit. We'll break out the laser pointer here. So when we're thinking about this system, again, it's set up like a pyramid, but it's pyramid in quotation marks. So again, this is very much a feudalism is a system based on security through obligation and going up the pyramid uh, to the class above you are going to be some things. And in return, those people are going to be providing stuff on the other side. So we have the peasants and serfs at the bottom, the knights are above them, then you have the lords, and then you have, in a typical kingdom, the one king. So what goes up the pyramid is loyalty, obligation, and service. The peasants provide a service of working the farmland to the knights. The knights then are obligated and to provide their military service to the lords. The lords then provide their knights to the king. So that's what everybody gives to everybody above them. Going down the pyramid for his protection and justice. The king provides a system of justice and helps protect the lords, right? Whose knights, who uses then his knights to, uh, who provides a system of uh, land to the knights, who then provides protection to the peasants and the serfs. So that's how this system you kind know, of works just a little bit in a uh, nutshell. Another way to look at feudalism um, is again, if we take a look at a s one little manor, on that manor we'll have a plot of land. That plot of land will be worked by a peasant. He's providing labor and work for this manor. Each manor is going to have a church. A church is going to have a priest. He's going to be praying for everyone's salvation. So he's going to be praying for everyone. And this these priests and peasants are going to be protected by a knight. Now, he might have a quote-unquote castle or I think the manor, but he's going to provide protection and security to these people in the uh, manor system. This manor was granted to this particular knight by a lord. The lord then is providing his, uh, the knight is providing loyalty in exchange in his military service to that lord. The lord then is providing his knights to the king who's the ultimate authority in the kingdom. So this is a kind of a smaller micro level from a manor all the way up. If we take it from a kingdom level, right, and we'll break out the laser pointer, the king is going to have one, his own manor, right, his own kind of uh, fiefdom that's providing stuff directly to the king, but he's got a giant territory. So he, for this, say the king of France, and this is the Ile de France, right, you've got Aquitaine, you've got Gascony, you've got Landouac, and then from there, those different lords then break up those lands even farther to the different manors provided all the way on there. So if the king of France wants to go to war with the Holy Roman Empire, he goes and he calls on his lords who then calls on their knights and they go off and they fight. So that's kind of how that uh, system uh, works there in uh, feudalism. And if you want to take another look at it, uh, this is something we got off the BBC's website. Uh, we have the King of England at the top. King of England during the Middle Ages has 180 barons who can call upon 3,000 to 5,000 knights. So if the king wants to go to war, he can bring 5,000 English knights with them. And these guys are all supported in the field and back at home by one and a half to two million peasants. So very much that pyramid shape that uh, we, we, t we talked about in, in setting this up. As we're moving through feudalism, we're talking about these knights. What are knights? Uh, well, we see three major things that change to warfare after the 700s that leads to the creation of the stereotypical Middle Ages medieval knight. So the first thing is bigger, stronger horses. Uh, and what we see here is the development of the use of selective breeding uh, to create bigger, stronger horses, the great European war horse, to be able to support um, a knight in armor with armor uh, on there. And um, so these bigger, stronger horses uh, provide a bigger, stronger impacts on the charge. Uh, and, and so that's one big development of, of these more powerful horses. The second major development is the use of a saddle. Uh, if, you, if you kind of think of it, it's interesting um, that Julius Caesar did all of his conquering, the Romans did all the conquering, without saddles on their horses. They rode bareback. Um, the, the saddle is to help the uh, kind of the physics of the situation. If you are a knight on horseback, and again, think about it, if you're in medieval times, you've got your spear, your lance underneath. If I'm going and I'm attacking you, 
all right, um, as, as we're coming across, and my spear impacts uh, a foot soldier on the bottom. There's, again, the law of uh, three laws, Newton's third laws of motion, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So if I'm putting my power of the horse and me through that shield, but that shield is also providing a force back onto me. And if you're strong enough or you are able to do that, um, without a saddle, you're not really tied onto that horse very well. And so you could just be sticking up in the middle of the air like a Bugs Bunny cartoon with your feet dangling in, in the air almost. So the saddle kind of takes that warrior and turns their lower body into kind of, and again, we want to think of more of the physics of this equation, the lower body of the horse. You're transferring that horse's energy and inertia into that small little point of your spear um, that's then being driven into another person, which very much creates a very dangerous situation to be on the other end of, uh, particularly as these horses get bigger, stronger, and faster. So that's what that saddle provides is a very f uh, fighting platform to do that. In combination with the saddles are stirrups, and this is where we usually call the, our horse people in class to be able to kind of help us out here. The stirrups hang off the saddles and provide a place for your feet on either side of the horse's back. And so this gives you a easier way to be able to ride and makes it a little bit more comfortable and to handle heavier weapons and further ties your lower half of your body to that horse. So I can reach down to the left or down to the right and be able to stay on top of that horse and make the man and the horse one and the same. And so this very much creates a very formidable um, fighting person on the battlefield and really the major moment of any European battle from about the 700s, oh, you can make your case all the way up to uh, the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s, even into we see giant cavalry charges in the First World War of the giant, what we called the Frankish Charge, where you get all of your knights on horseback lined up, and at the right moment of the battle, you send them in, and that's what you're hoping to turn the tide of the battle with. And so these three things allow for the knights to exist. So that's kind of the logistics of what happens and, and the kind of the political and economic relationships that local lords need these warriors to defend these territories. And we, we saw that with all these invasions, with all the stuff going on, the, the, your, your territory is being torn apart. And so you can only govern, you can only protect so much of it. So you need warriors to protect smaller areas of it. And that's where those knights come in. So in exchange for military service, when the lord or the king needs it, those knights would then be granted specific plots of land. And from that land, they would gain wealth from buying, selling, trading materials, which allows the knight, one, free time, so that they're not knee-deep in mud or having to harvest wheat during the harvest time. They can do other things, like devote their lives to war. And that's what these uh, knights are doing. Think about someone who only plays football from the time they can walk, how good they're going to be by the time they get to high school versus someone who just picked up football, say, in eighth grade. It, it, that experience, it, it's, it's that stuff that kind of goes that, and that's what they're able to do that. Plus that wealth is able to pay for the arms and armor that a knight kind of requires to protect themselves in battle. And these start to become, um, again, that's a little hard to kind of, be able to explain the economics of this but these suits of armor or i mean a, a random archer might need to have 120 days wages in order to be able to buy a very simple like uh off the rack uh kind of couple of pieces of armor uh from the 120 days being paid out in the field to buy that one couple pieces of armor to whereas it might be two or three years wages for the average foot soldier to be able to buy a kind of, again, cheap, made-to-order, off-the-Walmart rack piece of armor, and then you start getting anything that's more custom-fitted or by more prestigious armors that it starts to get into exponential and gigantic sums to be able to pay for this stuff. And that's not even talking about the fancy ceremonial stuff that's not really for combat. It's for the kings to strut their stuff in. So, uh, again, uh, it's hard to see in uh, this kind of medieval picture, but uh, what we see here is, again, our knight, right, sitting on the European high back saddle, and his feet are in stirrups. And so, again, that allows you to very much tie yourself into the horse and allow you to be able to have combat with other people on horses as well, more effectively for the foot soldiers who aren't on a horse on the ground. You can run and chase after them.
This is the European high back saddle. So again, you sit this way, one leg goes here, one leg goes on the other side, and you're going that way. So the high back keeps you from just sliding right off the back of the horse once you make contact. So it firmly roots you to that horse. And so you and this 1,200 pound animal become one and the same. And again, we're, we're talking about the physics of this equation of the battlefield. What also gives you kind of balance is the stirrups. So on, on the left here is an example of medieval stirrups from the time period. These are more modern stirrups. But that's, again, you get on a horse today. That's what you have. All right? And so, again, this provides well, with better balance and control of this animal underneath you to provide a much more um, firmer and much more um, easy to work with fighting platform. So obviously you want these horses to be able to protect you uh, on the battlefield and carry you away so you don't want them hurt. So as we start to get even more and more fancy, we'll get fancies of suits of armor and even suits of armor for the horse like that's on display here. Again, the major moment of the battlefield that we see from about the 800s, and again, you can really argue all the way up through the American Civil War, uh, the um, uh, the wars at the turn of the century and into World War I is the cavalry charge, the Frankish charge of the Middle Ages that's very feared. You're your 100, 200 knights in the battlefield in their suits of armor, get on their horse and go and try to turn the tide of the battle as they're being thrown in there. Uh, really, your knights are, are really you're hoping that your foot soldiers kind of get the enemy on the run and then your knights can go and track them down as they're going and retreating. Uh, lots of different fighting. Uh, from there, uh, again, this becomes a major component of people's lives and their identity is their ability to fight. Uh, and so we have people who are going like this, where if you pay attention to the skeleton, it's not the best picture. But on the left here, the actual skeleton, you can see that this guy is missing a hand. Is, something happened to him. And so he was buried here with a knife for a hand that had leather straps that had this knife on there to be able to make him so that he only had one hand, but he had at least two knives that he was going and fighting with. So that's the type of stuff that's being carried over in, in these military societies from this time period. So as we're moving through here um, and we're talking about the fragmentation of these empires, with the death of Louis the Pious, the Frankish Empire begins to fragment into numerous smaller counties. These smaller counties begin to look towards ways of getting and protecting their own wealth and not having wealth that they're collecting being turned back over to a higher-up nobility or a, a, a king at all. So right around the year the 9 to 1,000, we get castellans, and these are individuals who are able to build one or more castles, begin to break away from the counts set up by Charlemagne and, and the other Frankish kings to kind of go and hoard that wealth for themselves. And how are they able to do that? Because they're building their own, and you can see this is emphasized, capital S stone castles. And really, I'm going to take the taxes that should be going to the king. I'm going to hold it up. And if you want to get it, you can come get it, but you're going to break down my stone castle. You can't just light it on fire. And so what we see here is that the castellans will begin to seize the financial and judicial power that normally would go to the king. Again, this gets into the whole um, fighting that's happening between all the different invading groups. And people begin to look towards the castellans because, again, if the Vikings show up, you're not going to sit up there and twirl your thumbs and wait for the king to come. You're going to want to bust your rear end to get into that castle to protect yourself. As those castellan uh, are going to gain more power, they're able to gain more land, which allows them to buy more knights, which allows them to use even more of their own muscle to enforce and impose their rights of lordship on the surrounding areas. And so this gets into the great age of castle building that we see from about the 900s through uh, really the 1500s. So this is a pretty famous castle. This is in uh, this new Schweinstein Castle in Bavaria. Um, and this is an interesting castle because this is built in the 1800s uh, by Mad King Ludwig, the king of Bavaria, uh, trying to create a romanticized, uh, kind of in quotations, 18th uh, 19th century vision of what castles would have looked like. Uh, but again, this is not a, quote, functional military castle that we would have saw in, uh, seen in, in the Middle Ages time period. So the first castles, and we see the evolution here, are going to be your typical Mott and Bailey castles. Um, the um, Mott would be the fortified hilltop, kind of going back from the old Roman hilltops uh, with the Bailey down underneath. And then we see the slow uh, kind of uh, increase of not only stone in these fortifications, but the um, 
military implications of them. So we're just going to rattle off a couple of different examples of these castles here. Uh, so this is, a, again, a pretty early example of the transition from the Roman hilltop forts that were built throughout the Roman Empire, uh, where you have your mod at the top to where you have your bailey with your giant castle keep protecting the couple of doors that are in there. You can't get in if you can't get through the door. So that's kind of the, the main idea. Uh, a modern day example of a castle that still exists today is Windsor Castle in England, which is still an example, uh, a little bit more built up over time, but it's still got the classic mott and bailey castle keep um, that the kings of England, this is more of their quote-unquote home that we have uh, in there. So we usually like to play spot the castle in class. Uh, so if, see if you can find the castle in here. But the idea is that the surrounding countryside is providing all this work and labor. And if other guys show up who want to steal stuff, you can go and you can run up the hill into the castle. And from this vantage point, you can see all the way out in there. So those castles are built not only to protect the surrounding countryside, they're also used, say, on rivers. So we have the castle down over in here to try to be able to go and impose taxes and fees and tolls on people as you travel. Uh, the castles usually will try to incorporate the geography of the local land in there, so it can be hard to tack on this castle because there's really only one way in by land it's going to be pretty hard to go up any of the sides and again from the walls you can see anybody going ships sailing around uh we get more fanciful ones if you watch the tour de france in the summertime your french chateaus are really castles all right that are kind of built up and, and modernized over time um but if we, we usually ask this question in class what would why is there a drawbridge here because why is there an indentation because that would be your typical moat that'd be filled with water uh, during the, or at least an earlier part of the time period. Really, the great age of castle building is built on the Welsh-English frontier. As the kings of France begin to move into Wales, how do they able to keep the Welsh under their rule and impose the king's rule on the Welsh is through castles. And so that's where we see a very big wave of castle building, and that's why we see a lot of castles in England and in Wales today. As they went uh, and through that, some of these you might recognize from, say, your Harry Potter movies, um, because, again, England has a whole lot of them built up in there. And again, we got a couple different examples. This is another one from France. And we can kind of see that over time, towns and more and more people begin to congregate inside the castle walls for more protection. These begin to be developed and we kind of see a, a way of looking uh, uh, development of a little bit more not so quote-unquote urban uh, places, but places where people are a little bit more closer together than being spread out through the countryside like what we just saw earlier on in the Middle Ages. Because knights' sole function is to fight, what we see constantly during the Middle Ages is a lot of fighting. It makes sense. If I'm devoting my entire life to baking cookies, why would I not bake cookies? If I'm devoting my entire life to learning how to fight and be an excellent warrior, I would want to show that off to people. So fighting throughout the Middle Ages becomes a giant problem, not just for the nobility, but for everybody else. If two nobles show up on your farm and start fighting, they're gonna tear up your farm. You're not gonna be able to harvest stuff. That's a major social problem for everybody throughout the kind of social classes. It doesn't matter, this fighting affects everyone. Now, why do we see this? There's a collapse of the central authority. The, the kings are already losing power through multiple ways we've already mentioned, and we're still seeing that. Uh, there's that general fighting spirit that we just talked about. If you are a fighter, that is your identity. You go and you fight people. So this is kind of, you're willing to fight someone on the drop of a hat, and when you have 100 guys from one side and 100 guys from the other side show up on your farm to fight, that's a problem. Plus, Everybody is willing to pick a fight because if you get into a sticky situation, you can just run back to your castle and say, no, 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 come and get me. I'm inside my stone castle and you can sit down through there. So this becomes this fighting becomes a giant problem for all of society in the Middle Ages. And we'll see how that kind of as we move through the Middle Ages unit, how that's kind of addressed in different ways. The clergy tries to stick their nose in this to get people to stop fighting. So the clergy and, and, and the popes and the cardinals try to institute the peace of God movement, which said by Catholic decree, certain groups are not allowed to be fought with by nobles. Right? You can only fight other nobles. You can't go and you pick on peasants. You can't do other stuff. There's the truce of God movement. This is for mid nobles from fighting on certain days of the week, say like the Sunday, the Sabbath, the Holy Day, in certain times during the year, say like Easter or during Advent or during Lent. So if you're going by that truce of God 
movement, but it's really like 60, 70 days that you're allowed to fight because you can't do it on this Saints day, you can't do it on that Saints day to try to quote unquote legally say you can only fight other people on these days to lessen those fighting, right? If you want to take a guess, does this work? No, unable, absolutely not. The movement is unable to stop the fighting. It becomes a giant mess. So the knights try to be able to fix this themselves. So society says, knights, you're causing problems. The knights say, well, maybe we can do something to help it. And their creation is what's called the Chivalric Code. And the Chivalric Code was an attempt to create a positive role in society for knights to take. This was a code that was a complex set of ideals for knights to be brave, honest, generous, and loyal. Again, we can compare the Chivalric Code that's being developed at this time in Western Europe with the Bushido code for the samurai, which is being developed at the exact same time in human history on the other side of the earth in Japan. The Shavala code says you're supposed to use your fighting skills to defend the defenseless and not to oppress. You're not going to go pick on um, peasants who've got rakes with your giant suits of armor and swords. Chivalry also dictated that a true knight is going to serve three masters. Their feudal lord that granted them their uh, fief to be able to gain their wealth and their free time. The Lord God in heaven and the knight's chosen lady, right, who you're supposed to do stuff. Now, this is where chivalry kind of gets into what's the true way actually people did it or what's in the stories that we see that. But the knight's chosen lady that we get through kind of the stories and examples is one that's usually married, usually your feudal lord uh, wife that you're kind of going and doing stuff for. And what happens when one or both parties catch feelings and it becomes a bigger mess. So the, the whole idea is that you're trying to lessen the impact of these knights fighting on the rest of society. So the Chivalric Code also created an outlet for fighting in tournaments for knights to be able to go and fight in more ritualistic style combat. People still died. People still got seriously injured. But you're able to show off your fighting skills. I can be a good fighter and I'm not affecting this quarter of France. Um, there's not really – I can't just go hold up a book in front of the class that says Chivalric Code. And there's not, a, there's not a big giant iron tablet that says this is Code 1 and Code 2. Really, you learn about the Chivalric Code by reading stories and tales. And so a genre of what are called romances, not so much like your um, romance novels your, that, that are in like the, the, the drugstore with the hunks on the covers, m more like the idea of this is how a knight is supposed to be in there. And, and these were written in, and this is important, I'll underline with my laser pointer, local languages. So it's easy for people to go and get this message to help spread that. So a very easy example to understand how a knight is supposed to act, if you read the uh, tales of King Arthur's knights in Camelot and the Knights of the Round Table, the great example of a true chivalric knight would be your, say, your, your, your Lancelots, uh, your Gawains, right? Uh, and so those are great examples of how does a knight learn how to be a, quote, chivalric knight? They read King Arthur and they see what this knight is doing and that's how they go and they try to act. So as we're talking about this, again, chivalry dictates that a knight serves their three masters, their, this my laser pointer, uh, feudal lord, uh, who granted them their land, who they then have to provide their military service for, their lord god in heaven, and then their knight's chosen lady. And that lady is who you're fighting your tournaments in, who you're going to go do stuff you're going to bring back uh, to there. So that might be someone you're romantically interested in. That might be someone that you're kind of you're lifting up, you're kind of play acting towards the uh, feudal lord's wife, but again, it gets a little bit um, tricky and hard to understand there. The other way that chivalry is kind of explained to everybody is through poems and songs, and this is where the role of troubadours comes in. So with this code of chivalry, over time, the knight's duty to his lady becomes just as important to the duty of his lord. And like we said, in many poems, this conflict is going to result in problems for these knights, which is going to become a major issue. So who's writing these poems are troubadours. These are traveling poet musicians at the castles and courts of Europe who are going on there and writing these poems, writing these uh, songs, performing them, and that helps spread these ideas through there. Uh, these songs are about the joys and sorrows of romantic love. You're a freshman in high school, so you know all about that. You know that you are wearing T-shirts and she's wearing short skirts. You're sitting in the bleachers. She's with the cheerleaders, all, all that stuff right there. So they're, they're getting all that. The problem 
that we see in these poems, particularly again, we see this in media today, is that these poems are going to create an artificial vision of women. So these poems, and we'll see this in our homework with uh, chivalry if you read these, is is that a woman should look like this, and a woman should look like the uh, act uh, should look like this, and act like this, and do this, and learn be able to do that, and so that creates this kind of quote unattainable vision of what a woman is, which makes it very hard for a woman to lead up to that, which also on the flip side makes it very hard for men to find that perfect vision of a woman because if they're looking for a woman from these songs that can do X, Y, and Z, and the woman that they kind of like, it can only do X, well, is that a is that a woman that a knight likes? So these po poems creating this artificial vision of women affect women of the time period, but they're also affecting men as well. So that's kind of the issue here. Now, Eleanor of Aquitaine is going to be a name that's going to pop up again and again and again throughout our Middle Ages unit. We could do a whole semester or a whole year just on her, how big a deal she is. But she is going to be important, and particularly on her quiz, she's going to be important because she is someone who very much like these stories, like these poems, like these uh, this brand of music. And so she's going to encourage and spread this idea of romantic love throughout Europe. She's going to be married to the king of France. Uh, she's then later going to be married to the king of England. She's going to go on the Second Crusade. So as she's doing all this traveling, she's bringing these ideas with her court. She's going to spread these ideas. So in terms of this idea of courtly love and chivalry, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who, again, sidebar, vastly important politically and for very much other reasons in European history, but for this part, and uh, what you need to know for the quiz is that she's very much going to spread this idea of chivalry through her travels um, and through her marriages throughout Europe. So I just got a couple examples of troubadours here to finish up. So again, you got your guy with your lute playing in front of everybody. Right? Again, talking about scenarios where this princess really wants this prince, and how are you going to get in there? Are you going to sneak around the dad, and you're going to go hoist them up through the water bucket here? Our last side, here's your classic guy uh, going and pitching woo to our uh, lady here. Uh, he's got, he's doing his best uh, classic guy from college with his acoustic guitar at the party. He's playing the music. He's trying to get to convince this girl to do this, that, and the other. And again, you got a dad. You got somebody else looking on saying, hey, what's going on? What's the deal here? So those are our troubadours. Uh, that's what we'll, we'll finish up here with. Uh, kind of a, a little bit more of a societal take on the Middle Ages. We're moving into uh, religion of the time period, what the Catholic Church is doing, and into their building of the cathedrals in our next lecture.